Hi, my name is uh, Larry Hanley. I'm an associate professor in the English department at San Francisco State University, and I'm also a member of the California Open Educational Resource Council. And I'm here today to talk about the College Textbook Affordability Act of 2015. Um, the uh, act was passed last year uh, to uh, basically help California public college and university students save money. Um, and the route for this uh, savings uh, is uh, a proposal from your campus uh, to adopt high quality free and open educational resources uh, for course materials. Uh, you can check out the request for proposals uh, and all kinds of other documentation about AB 798, the proposal process, etc., at cool4ed.org. Uh, uh, each campus can be awarded up to $50,000 to implement uh, a program uh, for OER adoption. Uh, and you'll report back on your savings, et cetera. So today what I'm going to do is just run through uh, some of the basics. What is OER? Um, what's the big deal about OER? Why are we interested in OER? What are some resources for finding open educational resources and open textbooks? So <clears throat> open educational resources, as you can see from the slide, are high quality teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license, such as the Creative Commons license. So what this essentially means uh, is that these are materials that all kinds of people have created that are available at no cost uh, to students and to faculty. Uh, and they typically are licensed as intellectual property through the Creative Commons licensing system. And let me just show you what that looks like right now. So there are four different kinds of Creative Commons licenses, uh, attribution, non-commercial, no derivative works, and share alike. And each of these licenses, uh, which is attached to a particular resource or object or textbook, tells you uh, how that object, resource, or textbook can be used. So just to give you a little uh, glimpse of this, uh, when you see the license attribution CC BY, that means you can share, remix, and make money, uh, as long as you mention the author. If you see a, a CC attribution non-commercial, that means you can share and remix. Uh, you have to mention the author, but you cannot profit uh, from that use. So these are the one, two, three, four, five, six possibilities uh, for Creative Commons licensing. But the basic principle is everything that's creatively, that's licensed via Creative Commons can be shared. Uh, and then the other kinds of uses that are permitted follow from the particular license. So as you're looking at OER resources or searching for OER resources, you just want to pay a little attention to uh, what kind of license uh, those resources enjoy. Uh, and if it's a Creative Commons license, maybe take a look and see what does the license permit me or my campus or my faculty uh, to do with the material. Okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, the main impetus of, uh, of uh, AB 798 and the campus awards uh, is to, of course, lower textbook and learning costs for our students. Uh, now, OERs have been around for a while. <coughs> Uh, they've been used in California, in the United States, uh, around the globe. Uh, and so you might think to yourself, well, besides affordability, what else is involved in OER use? Uh, and so we've included, and again, you can find uh, further case studies on the Cool for Ed website, uh, some faculty showcases about how public higher education faculty in California use uh, OERs. Uh, how successful their use has been, um, and what kinds of uses under what conditions for one course, for a course of many sections, et cetera. Uh, so again, you can go to Cool for Ed uh, and look at our faculty showcases um, to see how people are using OER uh, and what they have to report about the use of those resources. Uh, one of the important components of AB 798 is a metric for measuring affordability. 
that is for measuring how much money you're saving your students by adopting OER. Uh, so here's one uh, simple calculation from the adoption of a free open textbook uh, at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, the original text for the course management information systems was $139, which actually is relatively cheap these days uh, for a college text, new college textbook. Uh, that textbook was replaced <coughs> in 2015-2016 for multiple sections, and that dropped the cost of instructional materials uh, from $139 to zero dollars, uh, saving $167,000 for students. So you can imagine the scale of savings that can be achieved uh, by substituting uh, an open textbook or OER materials uh, for you know, a publisher's textbook. Let me just show you, uh, one of my colleagues has also uh, provided some more uh, examples. And uh, let me pull up here the uh, slide from a different presentation to show you. OK, so here you can see, I hope you can see, uh, here's an example from Business 134 Corporate Finance, uh, previously assigned textbooks, uh, $253 new for the new textbook, the rental and use prices, uh, $193 <coughs> for the alternative textbook, uh, 69 students were enrolled, uh, and if you were to adopt open textbook or free open textbooks, uh, you would save $17,000. Uh, introductory psychology, again, with 570 students, uh, at about $135 per new textbook. The savings are about $76,950. Uh, let me get back to my slides here, if I can. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so those are some examples of cost savings. Now, in the language <coughs> of AB 798 and in your, in your application or your request your, your RFP, uh, there is a breakdown for how you calculate uh, cost savings. Um, and that breakdown uh, is essentially the following. Uh, there's, you get $1,000 uh, for each course uh, or course section in which you can uh, show at least a 30% cost saving over the previous term. So, for instance, uh, you know, if you have 10 sections that are adopting free and open textbooks, uh, and the cost savings in each of those sections is 30%, then you would get or apply for a $10,000 uh, award for your campus. Okay. Um, for further questions about, you know, you know, those kinds of details, etc., just let me know or let somebody from the council know and we'll be happy to work with you. Uh, or go to Cool Fred where we have all kinds of FAQs um, <clears throat> and information and resources for calculating uh, savings and affordability, et cetera. Okay, so, you know, great, OER is going to drop the textbook cost from $253 to $0, but where do I find these things? I mean, these free gems, uh, where do I find them and how can I get them? Uh, there are lots of places to find OER textbooks. Uh, one place to find OER textbooks, open textbooks, is on Cool Fred, and you can see the URL there. Uh, cool Fred curates uh, a, a full collection uh, of textbooks for general education courses the first two years, and these have been curated by the council. Uh, they have been peer reviewed by your colleagues. Uh, in the UC system, the CSU system, uh, in the community college system. You can read the reviews uh, and the ratings, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's a very convenient place to look for high quality uh, open educational resources and particularly open textbooks. Uh, you'll find course showcase reviews, faculty showcases, et cetera. Merlot, if you don't know Merlot, is a much bigger, broader, uh, collection of open educational resources and materials. Um, and I encourage you to look there as well if you don't find uh, anything appropriate 
uh, on the Cool for Ed site, or if you need uh, something in addition to or besides the textbooks on Cool for Ed. All right. Uh, <clears throat> OER Bingo, <clears throat> that is, you know, you can go to any one of the, these various sites and also look for textbooks, open textbooks. Those include OpenStax, Sailor.org, BC Campus, and Boundless. Uh, some of the OpenStax textbooks are already on Cool Fred, as well as the Sailor textbooks and the BC Campus uh, productions, etc. cetera. Uh, but nonetheless, um, these are some big, major, significant OER publishers uh, who are uh, producing content now, and you can look there. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, my gosh. What did I do? Uh, let's keep going here. And now my slides have shrunken down. Oh, there we go. What about a OER that isn't a textbook? Sorry about that. Uh, this is the Collaborate platform, and I'm kind of new to it. In any case, uh, OER does not just need textbooks. There's a lot more to the world of open educational resources than a textbook. The Assembly Bill of 798, the Bonilla Bill, also includes things like full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, faculty created content, streaming videos, etc., as acceptable open educational resources. Again, the one thing to keep in mind is these have to be substituted for, uh, you know, premium uh, or uh, purchase uh, materials in order to achieve that savings. Uh, so if you don't choose a textbook or if you have a textbook and some other things, whatever, uh, you need to put these together to substitute for the materials that students are purchasing now uh, in these sections uh, in these courses. Okay. Uh, so again, if you have a question about, well, is this an OER? Is this not an OER? What kind of OER is this? Uh, please let us know, and we'll be happy to help you out um, and uh, figure out whether it's EOR, how the OER works, et cetera. Okay. All right. Uh, that concludes our search and discover of OER materials. Um, there are some important dates to keep in mind. Uh, right now, you are probably actively engaged uh, in um, creating your proposal. Uh, let me just remind you, and I'm sure you all already know this, uh, but just to be safe, uh, the proposal <coughs> should be comprised of four sections. One is the Textbook Affordability Academic Senate Resolution. That is a resolution in support of textbook affordability uh, and OER uh, that each campus academic senate or governance, similar governance body must pass. That gets the ball rolling. You have to create a narrative for textbook, your textbook affordability plan. That narrative uh, has to be approved by the Campus Academic Senate. Uh, that approval can actually take place in several different ways. So again, please look at the uh, Cool for Ed site and the 798 RFP document uh, for further details. Your uh, proposal should also include uh, campus coordinator commitment. Uh, and the campus coordinator is basically a kind of liaison between the campus and the council, somebody who coordinates this particular adoption effort on your campus. And again, uh, there are some details about that, who can be a coordinator, uh, who cannot be a coordinator, et cetera. You'll have to look on the RFP for those. Uh, and then, in addition, uh, the kind of course, the list of courses uh, that you're targeting uh, for your savings and you'll have to calculate the predicted savings uh, per course. And I kind of ran through that very roughly uh, earlier, but if you have questions about that, again, please do get in touch with us. Uh, we want to help you. The deadline for proposals is June 30th, uh, and that's when the proposals should come to um, the council. The council reviews those proposals, et cetera, uh, and on September 30th, uh, you'll get the money uh, for your campus <clears throat> uh, from the fall of 2016 to, the ju to June of 2017. That's the next academic year. You'll conduct year one of your program, and at the end of that year, 
you will submit a progress report. If there are funds still left over from the initial legislative allotment, uh, we will have a second round of uh, bonus grants uh, to support uh, and further extend and mature uh, your campus efforts. All right. Um, one thing to keep in mind is also uh, there is a calendar for this web for webinars similar to this one. So if you missed this one, uh, or if there's some questions that aren't answered, uh, there's a full calendar uh, on the Cool for Ed site, um, etc. Okay. One thing I do want to mention is as you're drawing up your RFPs, you're finding you know, you've got your campus resolution, you're putting your team together. Uh, you've got your campus coordinator and you're writing your proposal. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the limit uh, for the award is $50,000. Uh, so that would be 50 course sections uh, w in which you are creating savings of 30% or more. So the question is what to do with those 50, what to do with that $50,000. Um, there are some things you cannot do, so I just want to put those on the table. You cannot directly compensate faculty for adopting OER. And that means you can't pay, you know, the person who's teaching the section of the course money uh, to adopt OER. Um, you cannot use the funds to develop MOOCs or online courses that include non-matriculated students. Uh, you cannot use the money to fund or support the creation of new OER materials. This is about adopting existing OER materials. You can't use that money to purchase new equipment. And the money can only go uh, towards supporting conversions to OER that begin in fall of 2016. That is, you can't go back in time and support uh, adoptions or adoption programs uh, that have occurred earlier this year, the year before, uh, et cetera. Um, so the money can be used <coughs> uh, for faculty development, and we are developing, uh, the council is developing uh, a little toolkit to help you think about what that faculty development uh, might look like. The money can also be used to support <coughs> uh, your campus coordinator. Um, so again, look at the RFP where we have a fairly detailed list of kind of what can be supported and what can't. Okay, uh, that brings me to the end of my webinar, or as I like to call it, the Temporary Autonomous Learning Event. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, and if you can't raise your hand, then please send an email uh, or get in touch with me uh, or anybody else on the council uh, through the Cool for Ed uh, page. Um, okay. The recording and the slides you've seen will be available later today. Here's the contact email, uh, coolfored at cdl.edu. Um, and if you want to get on our update list uh, for future webinars, et cetera, uh, there's a link there uh, to register. Uh, we really want to encourage you to get the process going, to create a very successful RFP. To do that, we're having the webinars. We're also going to have online office hours so you, you can workshop uh, your proposal, and we're happy to give you feedback on your RFP proposal. Uh, and that, I believe, is the end of the presentation. Here are some links if you want to click on those and find out uh, more detailed information about what I've talked about. Okay, thanks a lot. Oops, this hand. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Great talking to you. Enjoy.